Heather is an expert in economic and social policy, the former president of an inequality focused think tank Demos. She has drafted legislation, testified before Congress and contributes regu regularly to news outlets. She now chairs the Board of Color of Change, the nation's largest online racial justice organization. She holds a BA in American Studies from Yale University and a JD from the University of California, Berkeley. Heather, we are thrilled to have you here with us today. Thanks to everyone uh, who volunteers their time or is voluntold to join Common Read committees in their schools. Um, it's such a wonderful program. I'm really honored to have been able to share this afternoon uh, with the Senator. Senator, thank you for sharing your inspiring story and for all that you do to stand up for all of us. So I wrote The Some of Us uh, out of a journey that I took over the course of three years, a journey that took me from California to Mississippi to Maine and back again multiple times that was really about finding the answer to what should have been a simple question for a policy expert, which is, why can't we seem to have nice things in America? And by nice things, I don't mean hovercraft backpacks like we were supposed to have by now or laundry that does itself, which would be really nice. I mean, nice things like a well-funded school, public school in every neighborhood, reliable modern infrastructure, wages that can keep workers out of poverty, truly universal guaranteed health care, child care, elder care, the types of things that, that a society with as much wealth uh, and as much pride in the American dream should be able to provide for her people. And the we who can't seem to have nice things is both the white Americans who are the largest share of the impoverished and the uninsured and the Americans of color who are disproportionately so. And my journey took me across the country and revealed to me three core concepts that I share in the book that make it clear that racism in our politics and in our policymaking ultimately has a cost for everyone. Before I go into those three concepts, just briefly, I want to share uh, just personally how much the Common Read programs that I've been, uh, that the Some of Us has been involved in, have meant to me. In some ways, my real biggest dream for the book as I set it out into the world was that it would be read in groups, that it would be read in multiracial groups, diverse groups of people who are working together, learning together, trying to solve problems together. Because so often when we talk about race and racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it feels like there's a zero sum, that there's this sense of we're actually having a more divisive conversation than before we began to talk. When it seems sometimes like you become more aware of your differences and the weight of our history, most of which has been obscured to most people in America for so long, sort of is carried on all of our shoulders. It can be a challenging experience. But young people today, particularly those who are already in the America that is becoming, who are already living in a generation that has no racial majority, they're looking for a way in to the story of America's struggle with racism that they can all see themselves in black, white, brown, indigenous, API, where there's a sense that this is our story and we all have a stake in overcoming it. And that's why I wrote The Some of Us. It's really about the mutual interest that everyone has in addressing racism together. So I've been really pleased that the book has already been picked up by a number of schools and had as a common read or a first year experience. And it's been really interesting to me. There have been public schools like the City College of New York, the University of Georgia School of Social Work. There have been private liberal arts schools like Occidental and Wesleyan, a Catholic school, Loyola Marymount University and HBCU, Historically Black College, uh, Morgan State, and then a business school. I did a talk with them just last night at Emory University. It's been so interesting to me to hear how different groups of students have come together with faculty and administrators and found ways to keep the conversation about the sum of us going. And it's really been about these three core concepts. The first 
is the idea of the zero sum, that basically our progress, our economic and social progress in America is being held back by a worldview that is inaccurate. It's a worldview that says that there's sort of a fixed pie of well-being, that if I get a bigger slice, you must get a smaller one. And it's a particularly racialized worldview, according to the research, that shows that white people are more likely to see the world through this zero-sum prism. This idea that progress for folks of color has to come at white folks' expense. And so a lot of the sum of us goes into the history of where the zero sum lie came from, how it was used in our original founding days in order to justify an economic model that no longer obviously serves us, an economic model of stolen land, stolen people, and stolen labor, and how today, nonetheless, it's reanimated in our politics and our thinking. And I thoroughly refute the zero sum on economic terms. But the zero sum is often something that can lead to disastrous consequences when that belief system plays out in real life. And that leads me to the second concept in the book. It's the idea of the story of what happened to many of the nearly 2,000 lavishly funded grand resort style public swimming pools in America. When they were integrated, um, they were usually segregated, I'm sorry, in the 1930s and 40s when they were built as part of a building boom of public goods that included social security and massive investment in housing, the subsidization of the mortgage market to create mass home ownership, um, the GI Bill, robust funding for public colleges. This was all part of this public goods ethos that was reflected in those glittering resort style pools. But all of those public goods were racially restricted and segregated in one way or another. And the book explains how, to a degree that even I wasn't aware of before I set out to do the research for the book and take this journey, that whole system that created the greatest middle class the world had ever seen was in many ways racially restricted and segregated. And so too were the pools. So the story that is really the metaphor at the heart of the sum of us is one of what happened when integration came to America's public swimming pools. And so many towns and cities across the country decided to drain their public pools rather than integrate them. They literally drained out the water, backed up truckloads of dirt, seeded it over with grass. Of course, a drained public pool had a cost for everyone. It was a sense of self-sabotage, of dysfunction at the highest order. And it really is a metaphor, this idea of drained pool politics. And I weave it through in the book to show how it explains how we as a country turned away from the formula that created the great middle class. And I talk about drained pool politics in our inability to achieve collective action to address climate change drained pool politics in the creation of the student debt crisis and the shortchanging of funding for public colleges, drained pool politics in the story of universal health care and the battle for it. You know, I think that young people today are acutely aware that the challenges that are we are facing now more than ever and into the future are ones that we have to tackle together. And that's really the message of the sum of us. It's that collective action is how you truly can make an impact in the world. And in a multiracial country, that means joining together across lines of race. Fortunately, the book, which really is a hopeful one, tells stories of people doing just that. And that's the third concept in the book, the idea of the solidarity dividend. It's these gains of what we can unlock when people come together across lines of race. I tell stories from all over the country of unlikely neighbors putting aside their differences and building trust in winning things with tangible benefits that prove that it's not a zero sum and that we can refill the pool of public goods together winning things like cleaner air, higher wages, and better funded schools. The book weaves together hard economic data from my background as a policy analyst and advocate, history, not so much, but, and I'm not an historian, I was surprised to see it sort of picked up in, in, as a history book, but 
at the same time, I felt like you can't really understand our economy today and our society if you don't know just a little bit about where we've been. And then most importantly, stories. It was my favorite part of writing it. I got to go around the country and talk to ordinary people and use their stories, their stories of struggle and overcoming in order to really paint the picture of what is happening in this country. Um, I really wanna thank you all for what you do to make sure that books and ideas are still the windows to the world that they were for me as a child and that the Senator shared her own memories of. Um, it's so important now more than ever for us to affirm that reading a book together can actually create the kind of we, a bigger we that we're going to need to tackle our greatest challenges. Thank you.